Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Monday Morning Podcast for Monday, May 22nd, 2016. What's going on? How are ya? Um, Once again, I'm, I got uh, computer issues here that I got to get fixed when I get back to Los Angeles. I am in, um, I'm in Seattle, Seattle, Washington right now, which I got to tell you, man, if you come to Seattle in, in, in May or June when the sun is out, it's... Like, you'll want to live here. It really is one of the most beautiful cities in the United States. If you can just deal with overcast skies from, like, October through April. And um, these people pay the price. But when the sun comes out, it's fucking unbelievable. So I'm here with Nate Craig, who's been crushing it this whole fucking tour. And um, we just went out to get some eats. Like, a couple of tourists... We go, you want to go down to the fisherman place where they're throwing the fish and everything? So we're like, yeah. So we start walking down there. And, of course, it's mobbed. And I say to him, I go, you realize that nobody from Seattle fucking goes down here, you know, unless they're on like a first date or, you know, your dad and mom are taking you down there to go see it. But I would think that you would avoid it. So we didn't go all the way down there. We just kind of kept walking. We got a little bit, um, you know, we walked along that main drag. We just got a little bit away from it. And um, after wading into that sea of fucking humanity, I was literally like, dude, I will eat mediocre food if I don't have to stand in a line. I can actually sit down like a human being. Um, I know the food is good, but I I just don't understand. You're standing in like a fucking bread line, like it's the middle of a war or some shit. All right. You live in the United States of America. We don't stand in fucking line for food. We waddle our fat asses up. (laughs) <laughs> you just hand it to me. So I'm not going to name the place, but I went to this place. It was it was halfway. The bread fucking stunk. You know what I mean? How do you make fucking king crab only taste okay? You know how you, you have shitty bread. Other than that, it was uh, it was definitely a good time and um, such a beautiful city. Despite all the dirty white people up here, there's a major fucking you know. I want to avoid using the word grunge. I think that was just a nice way. Of, they're just they're fucking. There is some dirty fucking white people up here. I don't. I don't understand it. Just there in Denver. Those are the t- <laughs> the two filthiest white people that actually have money. Like you, you have too much money to be that filthy. Like when you go to Denver, uh, those fucking dreadlocked like man sandal wearing like always looking like you just got off a fucking one of those blow up tubes you know smoking your fucking weed whatever the whatever they're doing out there you know hairy armpit type of shit uh worse than san francisco i don't mind any of those styles if you if you bathe i mean it's 2016 jesus christ um up here it's like they're like uh This is probably just me being an old man. I can't honestly say none of them smelled, but they just, they look like, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to borrow anything that they used. (laughs) Why am I starting off this mean? I started off so nice. I was saying how beautiful it is. It's such a, the layout of the city is fucking perfect. And um, they, even with their new stadiums that they made, like I actually am old school as far as, I loved it back when they just had the kingdom, you know, and they had that great like uh, when the Seattle Supersonics had like, you know, the the skyline. I know that they had the Space Needle and I believe they had the kingdom there unless it was supposed to be Key Arena. I have no idea. But those two um, arenas um, were and are two of the coolest places ever. I saw a Seattle Supersonics game there uh, the last year they were there and it was Kevin Durant's first year. Somewhere, I don't know, I have a picture of him in the Seattle Seahawks, uh, Seattle Seahawks, Seattle, Super, Seattle Sonics, I should say, um, uniform. And then back in the day when I was just doing college gigs, traveling the road by myself, um, driving a Chrysler, Chrysler K car there. Um, I went to a game, uh, Seattle Mariners game at the Kingdom. And Ken Griffey Jr. was still on the team. This is how long ago it was. This was like the late 90s, possibly early 2000s. I forget when he went to the Reds. But um, I deliberately – I bought a, one single center field seat, and I got almost at the front row. I think I was the second row. 
and this is some sports fan geek shit. I sat there because not only did I want to watch Griffey play, but I also wanted to, like every night on Sports Center, whenever they showed a game at the Kingdom and somebody hit a home run, there was like this weird little runway, like aisleway, and you'd see people chasing after the ball. And I wanted the opportunity to uh, to do that, which I did all by myself. I didn't get the fucking ball. And um, so whatever. Um, but having said all that, if you ever visit Seattle in May or June and it's all sunny and you're like, oh, my God, I could live here. Make sure you come back in like January or December or some one of those fucking you know, I understand Kurt Cobain now. <laughs> One of those months. But anyways, we're uh, we're performing there tonight. Uh, I'm recording this podcast Sunday afternoon because uh, I got to get back um, and go back to the writer's room. Working on episode five, everybody. Five out of number ten. And uh, once we get this one done, it's all downhill from there. Uh, really excited about this episode. And... I don't know. I'm hoping you guys are going to like it. But anyways, um, so big uh, thank you to everybody who came out to Edmonton last night and who went out to Calgary. Uh, Calgary might have been the best sound I've, I've ever heard at a show. I was standing backstage and Nate Craig was on stage. I mean, the backstage area. And usually in most venues when you're standing to the side of the stage you can barely understand the person just the way the sound is bouncing around i'm sure it's fine in the house but like um you know so many times i'll be with bartnick or verzi or something they'll literally just be like dude you hear that new bit i bit i did about blah 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 i was like you know i was trying to but i i couldn't quite hear it because of the sound um i was standing almost like directly behind where and behind a curtain where Nate was on stage and I could hear the guy absolutely perfectly and um it was just fuck oh it was fucking awesome it was just a great gig both of the gigs um and then the next day you know we got up we drove up to Edmonton which believe it or not I've done that drive like three times and um just beautiful beautiful fucking country up in Canada absolutely gorgeous I would go out of my fucking mind I think if I did the road enough, though, if I just flew to other places, then I could come back. That's how I really view all these places, you know, that are considered the middle of nowhere. They're like these paradises. But I think I would lose my mind if all I did was live out there. Like, I understand the people when they come up to you. They're like, oh, my God, I want to get out of here. You know, this is the middle of fucking nowhere. And I'm always, you know, coming from L.A. where everybody's living on top of each other. And we have no water and shit. I'm like, dude, you are living in the Garden of Eden. Okay, this is as good as it gets as far as um, natural resources, four seasons and that type of shit. Although it was cold as fuck when we were up there. It's for May anyways. I mean, the last night in Edmonton was actually sleeting. (laughs) Fucking crazy. But um, we ended up driving, obviously, up to uh, Edmonton and that night at the gig. This might have been the weirdest fucking venue I've played in a long time. It was essentially, I took a picture of it. It was essentially a giant tent that had a little bit of an upper deck in the back. And um, there was no carpeting. Like behind me, they didn't, you had all this fucking equipment for the lights and everything. And they usually, they, they dress it up. They put a curtain there so people don't have to look at it. But they didn't. It was like this giant eyesore behind me. And I was standing on like this concrete slab that had no no carpeting, no nothing. The floor was all concrete. They just had chairs. The sides of the walls, I don't even know what they were made of. All I know was I was on stage. I felt like I was like screaming in a giant garage. Like I, I, It seemed loud to me, but I couldn't tell if it was loud. I didn't see anybody complaining, but like my ears are kind of ringing today. And I got a couple of tweets. People were saying like, like, dude, you sounded like you were yelling into a megaphone, into a microphone. So my apologies. I wish somebody had mentioned something on one of the shows. I would have toned it down. But sometimes when you're up there, you can't hear yourself. But I ended up, um, I sent a picture to Nia and uh, I should have had the tweet, uh, the message she sent me, the text that she sent me. She said, that looks like a venue where one of those, those fake televangelists, you know, have plants in the crowd and they go to like cure them and shit. And, um, 
I'll post a picture of it. And as always, I always say I'll fucking do it. Then I never do. But I'll, I'll try to do it this time. You know what? Whatever. If you follow the MMP on, on fucking uh, on Twitter, maybe it'll be up there. I have no idea. But um, before I go any further, uh, I, I forgot to mention um, the All Things Comedy Network is, is really uh, doing well. Because I, I, I'm a terrible businessman. I never bring it up. But um, we got some people to invest in it. We're going to start creating some more content, uh, content and that type of stuff. And, um, you know, really try to, I don't know, join forces with other comics and hopefully uh, make some comics some money off of that thing and get you guys some good comedy. Everybody works. We keep the big fuckos out of the way, you know, or at very least, you know, keep them from taking the rights of everybody's fucking shows, you know. That always seems to be like the the business plan, like, okay, yeah, we'll invest, all right, we own everything, you work for us, you go fuck yourself, we'll sleep in bed and make mailbox money, and you'll be on the road when you're 90. Sound good? No, it doesn't. Well, it's going to be good exposure. That's what they always say. Any young comics out there, anytime anybody tries to pay you an exposure, anytime they say it's good exposure, that means you're getting fucked. (laughs) Um, All right, also, this Thursday, I'm doing a uh, charity show um, this Thursday, 8 p.m. at the Comedy Store, 100% of the money goes towards helping children who are fighting cancer um, to have as normal of childhood as possible while they're going through the treatment and all that. Uh, the tickets are available at the Comedy Store. After the show, we'll, uh, we'll put up a link for anyone who can't make it if they want to donate. Um, Steve Simone puts the thing together and, um, he's been doing great things. He's been having comics go to hospitals and stuff like that. This is, this is a charity that I can get behind, which brings me back to the mysterious red nose campaign. So, um, a bunch of people were looking into that, found it very vague. And now I guess it helps out poor children. That's why you have the clown noses, which is hilarious to me because I think it's pretty much mainstream knowledge that clowns kind of scare the shit out of most children and, and a lot of adults. I just don't understand why you got to have this stupid clown nose. What are you going to do with that fucking thing? Other than just throw it out and then it's going to be, you know, it's going to end up in the fucking ocean and then back in the fish that you eat. It's so fucking dumb. Like, it's not enough to just say, listen, we are helping out poor children. Do people still say, nah. I don't want to do that. You got to be like, well, what if we give you a little red nosy nose? You're like, oh, okay. That sounds like a good idea. That's such like a fucking, I don't know. I think it's like a hacky charity thing. It all started with the, uh, I think it was the AIDS ribbon was the first thing. Or was it the quilt? And then came the Lance Armstrong live strong things, right? And I don't know, somewhere in there was the super finger. I have no fucking, I, I, don't, I don't, I don't pretend to know these things. Um, anyways, what am I, where the hell am I? Am I on? This, this fucking new thing is driving me nuts. I'm so used to not having to look at these fucking, this garage band shit. Um, oh, here's a nice creepy thing. It's really not a nice creepy thing. It's just sort of a fucking creepy thing. So we rented this car when we drove up from Calgary to, uh, drove up to Edmonton from Calgary. And we had the thing, actually we picked it up at the airport and, um, yeah, we were driving over to the casino. That's what it was driving over to the casino. And I find, I just look on the dashboard. I'm like, what the fuck is that? What is that on the dashboard? I'm like, is that a camera? I think it was a camera and I think it was pointed at us because there was nothing in the front. I don't know if it was the GPS antenna. I don't know what the fuck it was, but it was really creepy. So I, of course, threw a fucking newspaper over the goddamn thing. And um, when I got back to the hotel, I looked up about cars and cameras, and I found this article here. It says, is your rental car company spying on you and your driving? Here's how they do it. All right. Rental car giant Hertz has admitted it is. It has cameras installed in about one in eight of its cars in the United States, but those cameras built into Hertz's never-lost dashboard assistant that offers routing help and local city guides have never been turned on. Give me a fucking... Really? You spent all that money and you never turned them on, you lying cunts? Hertz has said loudly and repeatedly they've never turned them on. Understand that Never Lost 6 was launched by Hertz in early 2014, 
The product has been out there for over a year, and only now is it causing flap, probably because most wrenchers began noticing a creepy camera pointed at them. Um, understand, too, there are excellent reasons to worry about car rental companies, spy, uh, companies spying on drivers, um, but very probably never lost. Six is not one of them. Hertz said his last, it, has, it lacked the bandwidth to use the cameras anyway, but it has been so scorched but it scorched so severely in the media flap of the past weeks that industry experts indicated that Hertz now would be just about the last company to spy on its customers. Does any of that make any sense that you'd put a camera in there and then you wouldn't use it? You'd install a camera and, oh, we're just a little mom and pop place. We don't have the fucking bandwidth for it. Some of this shit's funny. They actually find some people like hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars using this shit. And basically, you know, when you rent a car. And they go, okay, you got to stay in the tri-state area or you're not leaving California, right? Some fucking guy, he ended up, he left California, went to Nevada and then Arizona. And then they they gave him a, uh, I don't know where the fuck it was. He was slapped with a bill of $3,405.05 by adding $1 per mile to each of the 2874 miles he had driven because he had crossed the California state line into Nevada. To me, that's funny. OK, because that guy's a piece of shit. He lied to the car company. All right. I'm not just saying Hertz is a piece of shit. People who buy rental cars and they treat them like shit are also pieces of shit. But I don't, I don't But to sit there and film people and then, you know, they're going to start recording conversations. Do You understand, like in the future. OK, you go to run for president. Like what could like. Bring you down is some fucked up thing you said, some argument you had in the car with some girlfriend you're not even with 20 years earlier. And they just bring that up in the middle of the debate. Like, I think in the future, like, they're literally, like, once you become a public figure, they will just have on a disc, you know, and it's all going to be logged. Anything you ever fucking did, like, questionable shit, good shit that you did, all the balance, you know, they'll probably just have like a pie chart. Okay, here's his life disc, you know, and the good stuff is in whatever, green or yellow, man, right? All the nice, friendly fucking colors. And then the bad shit will be all in like red. Um, I don't know if you're prone to depression, there'll be like some blue in there. And they'll just look at the big pie chart and try to judge it then overall what kind of a fucking person you are. It's just, it's, I don't know, it's really creepy. This is another one that was funny to me. It says in in Florida, rental car companies are notorious for literally shutting off engines of cars that cross straight state lines. The cars may be restarted upon agreement to pay the new fees. <laughs> That's fucking hilarious. Now here's my question: How do you know they're not in the left lane doing ninety miles an hour with somebody on their bumper, and you're just going to shut off their car? That you have to wait until the car stops. I would like to think that. But um, I don't know. Part of me, I don't mind if they track you with the GPS as far as that. And if you leave the state lines, I mean, that's only fair. You're fucking lying to them and the technology exists. But that shit to start recording conversations and uh, videotaping you is like, I don't know, man. That really crosses a line. Um I don't know. Some people say, well, what about all these assholes texting and driving? They're, they're, you know, they're killing people and that type of shit. There, there has to be a better way. What do you guys think? There's got to be a better way to keep. I mean, I don't even know how safe you have to make the world. I mean, there's too many fucking people. Can you let some people die? I mean, I know that's really morbid to say that shit, but um, I don't know. I'm kind of a fucked up person. So why, why, why would you listen to me? Why would you listen to this podcast? Oh, I know why. You're on your way to work, you're at the gym, you're whatever the fuck you're doing. So let's, uh, what should we do? Oh, man, I had a really bad, a bad little social f- faux pas. I have, after the Calgary thing, I was walking over to the hotel, and um, I was trying to get into the elevator because I was in the lobby. Sometimes you go through the lobby, you know, people want pictures and shit like that, which is cool, but Daddy wants to drink. <laughs> So I was trying to get through there as fast as I could. And one of the guys, you know, was at the, you know, one of the um, the guys who worked there sort of, you know, this elevator door opened and I fucking, he just sort of told me to come in and I just stepped in front of these people and walked on. 
me and Nate and the, and the promoter and the doors closed. And as we were going up, Nate goes, um, did we just step in front of a woman in a wheelchair waiting for an elevator? And then it dawned on me because I did see her, but I was in such a selfish moment of I don't want to take any you know pictures or anything. I just want to get back down because the bar was closing. That's right. And, you know, we had a great night and there's nothing better after a show. You're all fucking amped up from the excitement of doing it. And it went well that you can't just go back to your hotel room and go to sleep. You want to sit down, shoot the shit or whatever. So we were, that's right. We were making a mad dash to get down to the bar before before it closed. No, that's a lie. They were actually keeping it open for us. There was really no reason for me to do it other than my own selfish things. I didn't feel like taking a picture. So I ran in there and um, that has been bugging me for the last 48 fucking hours. Nate heard her say something sad of like, said something, well, I guess we're not getting on this one, you know, classic polite Canadian. So I don't know, for whatever fucking reason, if you're the person pushing the person in the wheelchair, my apologies. Oh, Freckles was a selfish cunt there. <laughs> I'm literally getting embarrassed telling the story right now, but that, that legitimately happened, and it was me. I don't know if my rental car company has video or audio of it, you know. I'm getting out in front of the story is what I'm doing. All right, enough of that Big Brother shit. Let's, uh, let's read some advertising here for the week. Um, MVMT Watches. Um, when you're in your early 20s and 30s, money can be tight. If you're not careful, dressing well can quickly drain your bank account, like spending $400 to $500 on a department store watch. There's some brand names out there that are charging insane prices for watches that aren't even remotely worth it. Well, if you want to look great when you go out but still have enough money to buy him or her a drink, check out movementwatches.com. These watches are really sharp. Uh, originally founded by two broke college kids, Movement Watches cut the middleman out and their big brand retail markups in order to give you a stylish watch that's at a, an affordable price. Movement Watches start at just 95 bucks. a watch with a de- department store quality for a fraction of the price. They're sleek and minimalistic, a modern twist on a classic style. Movement has grown organically purely by the supporters like you, so to join their more than 1 million social media followers and get a Movement Watch today... Um, here's where you go. Go to mvmtwatches.com slash burr, and they'll give you 15% off your entire order. That's mv, Michael Vincent, Michael Tango, watches.com slash burr. All right. Oh, Doc, Dollar Shave Club, everybody. I love how upset some of you truly are that it's actually Dr. Carver's shave butter. It was easy shave butter, but it's, now it's not easy anymore. But it was always Dr. Carver's. I just, you know, I have some sort of, um, I was kidding. I'm stupid. You know, I was going to say some sort of reading disability. That's a cop out. No, Bill, you're fucking dope. Dollar Shave Club, everybody. DollarShaveClub.com has a special offer for new members who join. You'll get a free month of the executive razor when you buy a tube of Dr. Carvey's shave butter. I hate it. I don't like it. Dr. Carvey's easy shave butter. This is the first time they've ever done something like this. And once you try the dollarshaveclub.com, you'll become a proud member like millions of others. One reason is because they deliver amazing razors right to your door for a third of the price of what the greedy razor corporations charge. That means when you join Dollar Shave Club, you can afford to shave with a fresh blade anytime you want, which feels fantastic. It just feels amazing on your face. You'll get a first class shave when you use the executive blade without hurting your wallet. Another reason is that Dr. Cabby's easy shave. Using it with the executive razor makes the blade glide gently to the, for the smoothest shave ever. Dr. Carver's shave butter isn't your average shave cream. It's unique conditioning formula and the hot, with high quality neutral ingredients, leaving your skin unbelievably soft and smooth. And right now, new members who buy a tube of shave butter get the executive razor for free. They've never done this before, everybody. Take advantage of it. And it's only available by going to dollarshaveclub.com slash burr. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash burr. One more, and then we're done. Stamps.com, everybody. You know, trips to the post office are never convenient. So why get postage right? Why not get postage right from your desk with stamps.com? Stamps.com even gives you special postage discounts you can't get at the post office, including first class, priority mail, express, international, and more. You'll never pay full price for postage again. Here's how Stamps.com works. Using your own computer and printer, 
You can buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter or package. Then just hand your mail to the mailman or drop it in a mailbox. It's that fucking easy. No wonder over 600,000 small businesses are already using Stamps.com. I use Stamps.com anytime I'm selling posters, um, whatever horse shit I'm selling after the show. If I can figure out how to use it, so can you. Right now, sign up to Stamps.com and use my last name, Burr, for this special offer. Four-week trial plus a $110 bonus offer that includes postage and a digital scale. Scale, don't wait. Get started with Stamps.com today. Go to Stamps.com before you do anything else. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Burr. That's Stamps.com. Enter Burr. There you go. Um, all right, let me get rid of all of this fucking coffee here so I can get on to the questions and all of that shit. By the way, did anybody watch Game 4 of the uh, – St. Louis, Louis, meet me at the fair. They gave the fucking shocks. See all right there, Fred. I'm not going to lie to you. As a complete bandwagon fan, this is one of the biggest examples of bandwagon fan shit you'll ever see is me becoming a blues fan. You know, just picking a team, right? And uh, I, after they lost game two and game three and how great the Sharks looked, I was just like, I was talking to my buddy going like, these guys look like they're dialed in. I think the Sharks are going to win the whole fucking thing. And um, this has just been such a weird series. Like game two, three, and four, you know, like Sharks dominated two and three. And then it's like they didn't even fucking show. And it's like the Blues didn't even show up games two and three. And I'm thinking like, ah, the Sharks got them figured out. They're going to make quick work of them. And then the Blues show up. Last night, it was like fucking game two and three never happened. So I can't figure it out. Somebody on Twitter sent me something saying these games have sucked because they've been so one-sided. Um, and I wouldn't argue. I wouldn't argue that. They haven't been actually the most compelling games. They've just been like three out of four games. have just been uh, a little fucking kick to the balls there. So so we'll see. We'll see. Um, I say I have no fucking clue anymore. I thought after two and three, I was like, not only are the Sharks going to beat the Blues, they're going to win the whole fucking thing because I'm not impressed with, uh, I mean, I like the Lightning, but they lost their fucking goaltender, and I thought that they were done. I thought they were fucking done, and now all of a sudden, you know, the fucking Penguins won two in a row, and then fucking Tampa Cans. Oh, Jesus. They're both two to two. I swear to God, if I didn't know better, that fucking piece of shit David Stern is running the goddamn NHL right now. Seems like he wants both of the series to go seven games so everybody makes their fucking money, right? They would never do something like that. What are they, the NFL? Um, oh, Jesus, I'm being, a, I'm being such a cunt. Such a goddamn cunt. Um, and I'm sort of paying attention to the basketball. I just don't have time. And I was really hoping that the Cleveland Cavaliers were going to go 16-0 and and win a title on two different levels. One... Cleveland would win a title, and all those sad sack Cleveland fans could quit with their stupid basset hound faces. You know what I mean? Cleveland fans are so fucking sad, and so many people just don't even give a shit. I mean, they, they just have the loneliest look on their face. At least when Boston couldn't win a World Series, New York had the decency to give a fuck enough to trash us, which was always funny to me when you really thought about it. It's like, why are you wasting your time? They were like Walmart getting mad at the one mom and pop store up the fucking street because we were also trying to sell rakes, right? Like, why do you give a shit? Um, but no one cares about, I don't know, Ohio. It's, it's amazing the amount of, of musicians, fighters, football coaches, entertainers. The list of famous people from Ohio might be the most impressive of, out of all the 50 states and uh, they don't get any respect. And But you go out there, it's just, I don't know, it's just kind of boring. It's a boring-ass state to fucking drive through. I don't know, but they're nice people. But I don't know, I don't know if I have sympathy for Cleveland fans. As much as they love Cleveland, it's like, yeah, well, why don't you live there? Nobody lives there. It's like a fucking ghost town. I guess gradually it's coming back. You know, ah, who gives a fuck? I just like shitting on people. Anyway, so I wanted to see them go 16-0 and because it would be great to see LeBron come back, you know, after all the Cleveland fans were burning burning his jersey when he left. You know, I always – that is just the stupidest fucking thing ever, just to go out and burn somebody's jersey as the news cameras 
are filming you. It's like, how fucking old are you? Are you really this emotionally invested in your fucking team? I mean, I love sports as much as anybody. I remember when What's-His-Face left. Ray Allen went to the Heat, and all these Celtics fans were mad. It's like, dude, that's how we got him. You know? He started with the Bucks, and then he fought. Once there's somebody, a, a player's a free agent, don't ever give your heart to the person. I'm telling you. You can't go 100% in because they, you know, they got that fucking, uh, they got that wandering eye. Sometimes they stay like Big Poppy, but most times, you know, they come, they come through town. They pile on the team. They win a championship. They start acting like they're fucking Magic Johnson and the Lakers or some shit. Larry Bird. You know, when they're really just, you know, they're window shopping throughout the fucking league. Um, but anyways, one of the cool things, if they actually went 16-0, and 0, it would be so fucked up that the Golden State Warriors, right? I'm assuming they make it to the finals, would go 73-9, and nine, beating the 96 Bulls and having the greatest regular season of all time and then losing the championship game, to me, would have been, you know, it's like the fucking 2008 Patriots. It's like they went 16-0 and 0 and, like, I don't, nobody gives a fuck. Nobody's ever going to give a fuck about that because all 16 and 0 does is well they went sick. Did they win this the next thing is did they win, go did they run the table? No. And then they lost the last one. <laughs> you know something actually having lived through that, why would I root that for that for Golden State? I don't know. You know what it is? There's something about LeBron that I actually feel bad about the guy. I feel bad for the guy. I don't know what it is. You know? He never seems to be on strong footing with the crowd. They always seem to somehow not like the guy. And he's out there like Superman every night. Um, who's kidding who? He brought it on. His agent brought it on him with that stupid fucking press conference. You know, doing his whole fucking life story. And then he just, I decided to take my talents to South Beach. He didn't even say, <laughs> he didn't even say Miami. It was one of the worst worded fucking statements ever. I've decided to take my talents to South Beach. It's like, you're going to leave these pound puppy looking sad sacks in Cleveland, freezing their fucking balls off. You're going to talk about your talent and then you're telling them that you're going to the beach. You know what? I don't feel bad for him. Um, I don't know. I really like LeBron. So I would like to see LeBron win one in, in Cleveland. It's great. He gets it for the city. But uh, when he does win it, if he does, I will I will really miss seeing those sad, sad Cleveland fans. They're just funny to me. I don't know what it is about them. I don't feel bad for them. And when they complain, I just laugh. I usually have empathy. <laughs> it's just something about them I don't. It's like Cubs, Cubs fans, some of them out there are still mad at me for that time when I said white, the White Sox fans were real fans. And I was just taking a stab in the dark. I was just fucking around because... This guy was talking about when the Bears beat the fuck out of the Patriots in the Super Bowl. So I just did the oldest trick in the book. I just went divide and conquer. And I just said that White Sox fans were better than Cubs fans. And it worked. You know what I mean? Years later, somebody's going, oh, you know, they're, they're in first place, but they have the fucking one of the worst attendances in the league. It's like, oh, whatever. Just go to your stupid game and take your fucking shirt off and act like you're in the big chill. <laughs> Um, anyways, the Cubs actually win it. That's, that's, that's the Theo Epstein fucking saga. You know what I mean? Like what happened to the Red Sox after 2004 was then all of a sudden it was like, you know, when your favorite band is just, you know, moving up the ladder, right? They're, they're, they're like gradually, you know, you know, they're playing clubs, local areas, and they start going a little national and then they play bigger and then they get all the way up to their best-selling sell album ever. And what always happens when a band that's been together for fucking 10 years, they make it to the mountaintop, what happens? The whole thing implodes. Everybody goes their separate ways. Next thing you know, fucking David Lee Roth is singing Just a Gigolo, right? And Van Halen is singing about dreams with the fucking Blue Angels. Whatever happened? I don't remember. I tried to block it out. I was... That fucking crushed me when they when they broke up. Um, he was the perfect front man for that fucking band. I love Sammy Hagar and everything, but come on. Um, anyways, uh, you 
guys are going to kill me, but I completely forget what I was fucking talking. What the fuck was my point? I literally have to scroll, me scroll back up. What the fuck was I just talking about? Oh, Theo Epstein. Jesus Christ. Um, Theo Epstein, after like 2004, I think everybody wanted the credit. I think the fucking ownership was like, no, we're the reason the 86 year curse ended. And Theo's like, well, what about me? And then there was that weird thing where he kind of went, he like left for like a week. And I remember thinking like, fuck, why couldn't they just get along? Here here we go again. And then he came back. And then, I don't know, when everything imploded, whenever the fuck it did, he ends up leaving. He goes to the Cubs. I thought he left and then decided to stay for a couple years. I might be wrong. But he went with the Cubs, and I think that that was his ego thing. And then the Red Sox won it in 07, and in uh, 2013, I believe. And that was our, fuck you, Theo, we can do it without you. So now, I think for his ego, he's trying to become the guy who ended the curse of the babe and the curse of the goat. And if he does that, I mean, you'd have to say he's one of the greatest, whatever the fuck his position is. Is that a GM? I don't know what he is. Um, curse of the goat is so fucking stupid. You know what I mean? Get your livestock off of the fucking field. You know? <laughs> curse of the babe was dumb enough. It's just like, no, we made a bad fucking move. We're not a good franchise. And we weren't a good franchise. We didn't make good decisions. The Yockeys, God bless them. Did not make good decisions. The guy was a major fucking racist and just refused until the last. I think we were, we were the last team to to finally admit, you know, I guess people from other races are worthy of looking at. And by then, we, we even then, I mean, we suck when it was just all white people. I mean, I don't know. What are you going to do? Um, so anyways, uh, let, let's read some of the uh, the questions here. I know I'm babbling this week. This is uh, I'm a little outside my comfort zone without the microphone and the fucking headset. So uh, this will all be fixed by uh, Thursday. Okay, vinyl. Hey, Billy, I was at your Madison Square Garden show, and I seem to remember you mentioning releasing it, releasing it on vinyl. Is that still happening? Um, interesting you should say that. I have the audio, and I'm going through pictures right now, and... Um, I am telling you right now, I am going for big air on this one. I am releasing the entire fucking show. I'm not editing anything out. I was happy from the second I got on to the second I left. It was one of the greatest nights of my stand-up life. I'm so happy that I have an audio recording of it. Um, Corey Angelo, one of the greatest photographers I've met in this business. The greatest, I should say. He took all the pictures and... um, I, if I if I do this right, it's going to be a sick ass fucking record, and uh, I'm very uh, very excited to do it. I just have to do it the right way. Um, what happens is, if you want to get into the bullshit of the business, is and this happened with the one that I did at Carnegie Hall. What happens is is when you put out a stand up special, you get in business with somebody like Comedy Central or Netflix or HBO or whatever. You know, usually built into the contract is that you won't release any similar material um, that's on the special for a specific period of time. And, um, you know, I'm probably going to do another special in November, which, you know, I did Madison Square Garden November of last year. So there's going to be enough overlap where I'm going to have to wait. I believe I'll have to wait a little bit. Um I'll try to get around that because I haven't negotiated yet. It would be nice if I could get around and be like, look, it's vinyl. It's for fucking total comedy nerds. This isn't going to really. Um... But then, of course, you cunts end up uploading it everywhere because everything has to be fucking uploaded and then be free. I'm going to lose my fucking shirt on this, but I don't give a shit um, because I know there's people out there that appreciate the vinyl and that type of stuff. And it's a really cool fucking thing to have. And. Um... Oh, man, I'm going to spend some money on this. I'm really going to spend some money on this. I, I really want to do this as first fucking class as I can. And I was actually talking to somebody about it the other night. Um, somebody who makes records and he was showing me some of the shit that he's done. And, and I was really impressed. So um, I'm literally getting excited talking about it. So uh, that's definitely happening. When I can actually release the fucking thing is a completely different uh, story. So. All right. Basic training. Uh, Billy Bloom, uh, you mentioned in a throwback clip 
that you would only perform for the troops in the Middle East if you went through basic training and was taught how to kill a man. Well, at least how to shoot a fucking gun. That's like my fear. I'm going into a fucking war zone, and God forbid it gets overrun by a bunch of lunatics, and my bodyguard takes one for me, and he's laying on the ground, and there's his weapon, and I'm like, I don't know how to work this. <laughs> Standing there like Bob Hope with a fucking putter. You know, I, I just, you know, I know, they, and they always say this shit too. We've never lost anyone. In all the wars that we fought, we've never lost anyone. It's just like, dude, that's just like saying, my, you know what? My car's running great. You don't say shit like that. Anyways, he said, was wondering if, if that's as true as it was when you said it in 2008, I believe. You're in better shape these days, and perhaps so is the Middle East. Uh, love you, love Nia. Um, nah, yeah, I think at this point, you know, look, dude, when I saw over there, like, when I was first thinking that, that was back, you know, when shit was really bad and, like, contractors, you know, would had a rock in their shoe and they would stop for half a second to get it out and then they just disappeared and then the next thing you know, they're getting their heads sawed off. You know, I mean, what a fucking way to go. I mean, Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? And I've also, one sort of thing, I've, one of the reasons why I've been, any success that I've had in life is I've always understood what I suck at. Okay? And I know I am not a Marine. You can give me the camouflage shit, you know, the dumb shit when people go out and go fucking uh, do shows for the troops and they take pictures of you sitting in a jet or like in a fucking tank and you're wearing a helmet, you know, and for half a second your ego's, I could do this. No, you can't do that. It takes a special person to be able to do that. And I know that's not me. Um, actually, to really be honest with you, I wouldn't want to go through basic training because I am a fucking lunatic to begin with. And the last thing I need to do is dehumanize any more people in my fucked up brain. <laughs> um. Yes, I, I am afraid of, of you know, to, to go down that rabbit hole of how fucking, how nuts am I, okay? I like to feel that I'm a mainstream psycho, you know? It's kind of like my drinking. Like, I know I drink way too much, but I, I have it under control. But I know a couple of circumstances, well, I'm too, I'm too vain to drink myself to death, but I could, I could definitely, uh, you know, I, I know enough not. I knew enough not to fuck with hard drugs Um, because I saw what they did to, you know, like everybody. I think everybody in my country at this point for, I I hate to say it, at this point you've you've lost somebody to that. I've lost uh, two people, two friends of mine outside of comedy and then uh, obviously a number of comedians to that type of shit and um, both friends of mine and then comics that I I was fans of and that type of shit. So I always knew not to fuck with that stuff. But as far as going over there, yeah, I I would definitely do that. I would definitely um, do something like that. But, you know, when it was really fucking crazy over there, and the comics were telling me they they had to do those military landings where you're like at 38,000 feet and a minute later you're on the ground. You know? I mean, it's it's scary enough landing in San Diego. (laughs) I don't need somebody possibly shooting at me. Um, yeah, and I'm just being fucking honest, you know what I mean? So, uh, but at this point, yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't have a problem. Oh, Jesus. If I ever fucking go over there and something happens to me and they play this fucking audio, you know, they're going to do it and all those fucking things. Um, yeah, you know, going to war is, is, it's no, that's the real deal. And I know I don't have that in me. Fucking go over there with a Hawaiian shirt. Hey, isn't that something? Going over there with whoever the Marilyn Monroe is of the day. And she's out there singing, you know, happy birthday, Mr. General, or whatever the fuck goes. I have no idea what happens on those shows. But um, I know, like, like, fucking Artie Lang went to, like, Artie Lang went into this shit in, like, Afghanistan. Like, fucking, like, crazy. You would never catch me doing that. That guy's got more balls than, than I would ever have. No. Um, but yeah, I'll go to the big base that already has a Best Buy on it. I'll go to that one. <laughs> Whatever military base over there that already has a monorail, I'll, I'll go to that one. Maybe like an Orange Julius. I'll check that one out. But I, I, I would definitely do it without a doubt. 
All right, uh, name dropping. Hey, Bill, um, I listen to the podcast every week, which means my wife does as well. Oh, geez, not another one of these. I know women hate me, okay? I, I walked in the hotel today, and this guy goes, oh, I didn't know you were in town. I said, yeah, you know, I'm playing a theater down the street. And he goes, uh, he goes, oh, he goes, you know, I'm definitely going to go. He goes, you know, I'm going to go. He goes, my girlfriend hates you, but I'm going to go. It's just like, I, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. I'm not going to change what the fuck I do, though. But I, I understand it. Here we go. All right. So, okay, here, here it comes. How long before I get, how, how much do I have to get, uh, read before I find out that she hates me? All right. Last week you said you didn't want to write, you didn't want to name drop your friend's name in a band. Um, this started my wife down a path of questioning and thought. I'll quote her. Who is Bill scared of? You would think he's still on a playground and waiting to get beat up if he acts out of order. He's Bill Burr. Who's going to give him shit? Um, she has a good point. I totally understand why you do that, but you'd have to drop a dozen big names that didn't even matter. But what? But you have to drop a dozen big names that didn't even matter into a story every week for a year for anyone to think of you as a name dropper. Uh, you're the best. Come back to Rhode Island. Um, you know why I don't do it? Because people who are in the public eye, there's like this sort of like there's a uh, there's an unwritten fucking rule that when you're hanging out with them, you're hanging out with them. And then it doesn't become a fucking podcast story. You don't fucking tweet about it. You know, you know, and you don't ask for a picture um, because that's what their life is. And I know people that have fucked that up. I got a buddy of mine. All right. He was golfing. And uh, he got put in this foursome with one of his favorite actors. And it turned out the actor was a fan of his. And they were having a great fucking time. All right? Just shooting the shit, being normal. And in the end, the guy goes, yeah, it's great, man. I'd love to come out to his show. And instead of saying, all right, give me your number. Uh, I'll text you next time I'm in town. He goes, great. He goes, is it, hey, is it, is it cool if I get a photo? And he said the guy's face just fucking dropped. And was just like, yeah, man. Yeah, okay. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I don't want to do that. To you. Look, like, I don't mind, you know, unless I'm trying to get to a bar before it closes. Those are only the times that I bug it, you know, bothers me that somebody wants a picture. It's, it's, it's way better if somebody wants a picture than nobody gives a fuck. But I'm also at a cool level of just being known. I'm known enough that I can sell tickets on the road. But, like, I can walk down the street. Nobody fucks with me, right? But those people that are at that other level, you know what I mean, where they can't leave the fucking house, you know, if you hang out with them, you don't go blabbing about it on a podcast. It's, uh, it's to put it bluntly, it's really fucking tacky, and it's not professional. And not to mention, you come off like a name-dropping cunt, you know? I actually had somebody do that to me one time. It fucking annoyed the shit out of me. I'm not, you know, somebody, uh, I was having this debate with somebody and then they ended up fucking writing something about it afterwards. And it's just like, oh, you know, I, I thought we were just a couple of comics hanging out. You know, I was just like, and just, I don't know. I just, gross is all I thought. Like that was fucking gross. Cause now I thought that, you know, we actually were talking human being to human being and now you're trying to get, turn it into something. You know, I don't know. It's gross. That's why I don't do it. All right. Um, all right. Wedding song. Dear Billy Cockring Bearer. <laughs> oh, Jesus. He's, uh, I'm getting married this summer. And my fiance and I are trying to figure out songs for the wedding. You dig music. What would you and the lovely Mia, M-I-A, it's Nia with an N, like Nancy, the lovely Nia suggests for our entrance and first dance. We appreciate your insight. Oh, my God. I can't write what the person just wrote. Jesus Christ. Easy with the homophobia there. Said, go fuck yourself. Um, I, I don't fuck. Dude, I listen to hair metal, man. You don't want to listen to me. I don't know. Something from Great White. How about White Lion? Um, one of those white bands. Because it was White Snake, White Lion, and Great White. Uh, that's like when they had all the number bands, right? 
Mary 3 and 4, 3, 11, some 41. Uh, I don't know what the fuck they are. All right. What song should you come up? I would think the song that both of you guys like. I have no idea. Uh, your wedding starts. All right. You're coming in. I don't know. I'd say something from Lou Rawls. Lady Love. You know, although he's kind of suggesting an open relationship a little bit if you really listen to it. Um, anyways, I don't fucking know. That's a weird one. I have no idea. I don't know what kind of music you're into. How about something from Cinderella? Speaking of which, um, from my generation, um, I just found out the drummer from Megadeth died last night. Um, was it Nick Menza? Is that his name? Yeah. Ex-Megadeth drummer Nick Menza collapses and dies on stage. 51 fucking years old. That's it. Um, it was like three songs in. He was at that place, The Baked Potato, which I have never been to. Um, it's a legendary music venue. Like, if you ever come out to L.A. and you want to go to a cool music venue and possibly see some huge fucking musician just basically jamming with a bunch of people from other bands or studio musicians, that's the place to go to. I've never been. I don't know why. I just always end up being busy having to do a stand-up show. But um, fortunately, he uh, he died uh, 51, going to be 52 years old, which is uh, is way too young in general. But when you're going to be 48 next month, it's pretty fucking scary. Should lay off the fucking chicken quesadillas. Um, all right, here we go. French music recommendation. Hey, Guillaume Le Rouge. Uh, I know you're working on your French skills, and you're always looking for music, so I thought I'd give you a, two, a twofer. Check out an artist named Stromayor. That's how you say it, Stromayor. No. <laughs> my God, I'm an idiot. Oh, my God, I'm a fucking idiot. It's Stromay, and then it was Dash, you're welcome. I thought the your was part of it. I thought it was Stromayor but it's Stromae. You're welcome. Oh my God. What a fucking dope. Ugh. Every time I think I find the bottom of my stupidity, there's a whole nother floor. Um, anyways, he's from Belgium and his stuff has a really diverse set of influence influences. But besides that, the music is amazing. Even if you have no idea what the fuck he's saying, I'm not a native French speaker. Wait, he's from Belgium, but he sings in French. Anyways, he goes, but my family spent some time in Belgium when I was a kid. I've forgotten a lot of my French over the years, and listening to this is bringing it all back to me. Uh, it says, bon, bon chance, canard. It's double N. I know canard is duck, so C-O-N-N-A-R-D. I don't know what that is. is it, it probably says good luck, fuckface. I have no dick or something. I don't know. Come back to New York City soon. That makes no sense to me that you were in Belgium and you learned how to speak, speak uh, French. I thought you'd be able to talk to uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. The muscles from Brussels, right? All right, girl. Wow, this guy tried to write girl is fucking with my head and she's so fucking with his head. He wrote girl, girls if fucking with my head. Uh, dear Billy Bats, um, a few months ago, my waitress at a Mexican restaurant Caught my eye with her cute smile and warm personality. I asked her out and things are going great. After two dates, we were having sex and I love spending time with her and making her laugh. She's also joining the Air Force and she used to ask me advice because I'm in the Marine Reserves. I didn't see her during her final week and late on Saturday during my drill weekend, she was texting that she was a terrible person and she was never going to amount to anything. Sounds like she fucked around with it on you. I'm um, sorry. That's just my paranoia. I consoled her and she sent a two-page text while I was asleep. At 6 a.m. the next morning, I woke up to the text that read, This has been eating away at me and I had a few glasses of wine and can't hold it in. Oh, here it comes. On Wednesday, I had lunch with my old friend with benefits and I ended up blowing him. I'm so sorry. I like you so much and I feel horrible. The next day, I asked a few details about the incidents. <laughs> oh Were you using your hand too, cranking the shaft? 
Um, I asked a few questions about the incident and said she had a strange way of showing affection towards me. I told her I didn't want to see her anymore and de- deleted all of her contact into my info from my phone and blocked her number. Perfect. Am I being too hard? Is it really so hard to not suck a dick? I've never had the urge. She even told me not to cheat on her and then does this. I probably should have seen it coming because apparently she'd also had a threesome with two guys. She seems so nice, though. This is the first time I've been cheated on and is fucking with my head. I'm 23. This shouldn't be that big of a deal, but my confidence took a serious blow here. No pun intended. Um, hey, dude, you know, that that happened to me at least three times in my life that I'm aware of. Women fucking cheat, too. All right. I mean, everybody knows that guys are dogs. But women do it fucking too, all right? And um, how many fucking, uh, I don't want to get it. It's just, dude, the only reason right now where you're questioning, am I being so hard on her? That's just your feelings talking because you miss her. But, dude, you did the right thing. You deleted her shit. You told her to fuck off. That's a big-time self-esteem move. And uh, you're only 23 years old. You got a b- bunch of great women in your future. Um, I'm not saying fuck her as far as her as a person, but just forget her as far as like someone that you can have a relationship with. But you know, she's obviously working out some stuff and, uh, you know, she, you know, she's on her path. You're on your path. And, uh, you're not looking for that. Sounds like, and, uh, yeah, you just, just move on. You did the right fucking thing. You know, allow yourself to be sad and go through the shit and all that. You know, don't do the dumb guy thing where you just try to shut off your feelings. Go through the feelings. Fucking cry it out of you when no one's around. Don't make it awkward for other fucking people. And then, uh, you know, just don't fuck with anybody for a while. You know, (laughs) figure out what the fuck you want to do next. But don't go back to her. You can't go back to her. Um, Yeah, I, I wouldn't do that. Plus, you know, she's joining the fucking Air Force. She's going to the Marines anyways. You know? Can't tell me this. You, you, you go, you're gonna probably go around the fucking world. You're gonna meet all kinds of beautiful women. She actually meant a long way. She probably did you a favor. That, and I'll tell you right now, that is as positive as I can spin that because I know it, it sucks. It sucks. You know what are you gonna do? All right. Um, something I wanted. Where the hell was it? As before, I wrap this up here. Uh, people keep asking me about the uh, the European tour. Now here's the thing. I am not allowed. To say what the dates are. It's definitely happening. But I can be vague about it at this point. I heard a rumor that it might start the end of July. Like the very end of July. Like maybe the last day of July. And I heard that it might go through, I don't know, mid-August. Like, mo, well, actually, August 8th, maybe to the 10th. It all fucking depends. All right? And the rumor is that it might start in a city that, in country that rhymes with Mublin, Fireland. And then it might go to a city that rhymes with uh, Hellcast. <laughs> oh, and then there's another one. Uh, hallway. Myerland. I'm not allowed to release any of this information. Then I might go to Pistol, uh, Fingland, Canfester, England, Munden, England, Hamster Cam, Featherlands, and uh, what the fuck kind of routing is that? Then I go up to Fedenboro, uh, Hotland. Possibly. That might that might be it. I'm not allowed to say, but uh, I don't know when we're going to do this thing. But I will tell you that I thought I was going to Belgium, and, and as of right now, it, that's not on the list, which is really bugging me because I really wanted to go there. So I'm hoping that maybe I can uh, – we'll see. I mean the amount of cities that we got offers from, um, if I'm still going to remain married – uh, I have to break it up into three 
three tours. So I think I'm going to do this one, and then maybe I'll do the Scandinavian one with Belgium on that one, and then an Eastern European one. I don't know how long it's going to take me to do all of those, but I definitely plan on doing them. And um, I'm extremely excited about getting over there. There's a lot of cities there that I've never played to, and um, I don't know. I, I, I can't wait to get over there. Plus, you know, it's going to be great for me. It's going to feel like a summer vacation because we'll be done writing all 10 episodes of F is for Family. So, anyways, that is um, that is the podcast for this week. Uh, once again, thank you to everybody who came out in Calgary, Edmonton, and Seattle tonight. This has been a great three-day run. And um, to arguably, you know, I got to tell you, Seattle, in, in all these areas up here, once you live out in a fucking desert, man, it's just, I always look down as the plane's landing going, what if I lived in that house right fucking there, you know? Somehow I was able to fucking exist in show business and not live out in LA, which I eventually maybe will be able to do. But then what am I going to do? I got to be in the writer's room. Um, eventually I'll be that guy. I'm going to be that guy. Eventually I'm going to be living next to a fucking lake in the middle of nowhere and, uh, staring at a wall, drinking myself to death. All right. That's it, everybody. That's the podcast. I'm going to watch the, uh, the blues game. Um, we'll see what happens here and, uh, go fuck yourselves and I will check in on you on uh, Thursday. All right. See you.